Hi and welcome to this session on how to score and how to interpret the Oxford Cognitive Screen. So the particular learning objectives for this uh, talk is really about the scoring. So you've seen a little bit before hopefully about the introduction and the background and then how to actually manage it, how to move your papers around. Um, and this uh, little video and uh, talk is about how you then actually go on and score it interpret the scores and how you use the wheel to report it. So section one, how to score. So we have a particular scoring template, which looks uh, like the one on the right. And then we use a visual snapshot report, which looks like the big circle here on the left. So it specifically denotes the different areas within attention, memory, language, number, uh, and practices that we are testing within the OX. And the aim is at the end for you to determine whether or not uh, the patient's performance, so their score, falls within or outside the normative uh, cutoffs, and then denote whether or not uh, there is an impairment in each of those domains. We do that simply by crossing out um, one of the areas where the impairment is. So here, this kind of little form you can have is uh, at the end of your participant pack typically, and it just for each of the scores says um, what is the max score and then um, gives you an overview in the end what the cutoffs are. So if you want, you can put your own participant score next to it and determine, okay, is that less than uh, the cutoff impaired, yes or no, and then cross out the specific uh, slice of the pie where the uh, problem uh, may have occurred. So I'll go now task by task and walk you through each of the tasks and how they're scored, uh, give you some examples of typical errors, and then give you some um, overview of the typical questions we've had. So I've been running quite a few of these uh, workshops over the years, and uh, we received a, a series of questions over different sessions and different times. I'm trying to put all of them together in this uh, one presentation, which may be a bit too much, but hopefully if you say have a particular um, query about one of the tasks, you can just skip to that one. Um, but if you are new to this, it may be worth you just going through all of uh, this uh, presentation one by one. Okay, the first task is a picture naming task. As you know uh, from the demonstration, there's four pictures and so the score is very simply out of four. Um, Typical uh, cutoff for this one is three, so people can make one error and still be okay. This is the impairment instance from one of our uh, samples in acute stroke. So you, as you can see, um, it's very, very common to have impairments within this task. So here are some example responses. So you might have a patient who is quite aphasic, um, doesn't give you any response verbally, but uh, shows you, for example, on the second one, an eating gesture, um, tries to mimic how you would open a drawer, um, and then maybe doesn't respond. So that would score zero um, on this particular task. But nonetheless, um, these examples are being given because I would hope that you uh, make note of this and you can see that they do understand what the meaning of it is and they can see um, what concepts are being uh, brought about, but those don't necessarily have the ability to name it. Um, similarly, you could have someone who makes these what we would call semantic errors. So they would say rhino instead of hippo, and then say some sort of fruit, some sort of box, some sort of fruit. And again, this person would score zero, but for a very different reason as the to the first person. So they clearly have an ability uh, to speak and to, to name things, but they're making errors in the specificity of the um, semantic categories. Finally, another example, um, these, these are all taken from real experiences over the years. Um, I still remember the first time they said, oh, this, this is like a rock, it's not a rock. How do I... um, but then you move on. And so for the second one, uh, they said slippers, and then the, the last one's a cupboard, and the final one is a pair. And so this person would score only one out of four because cupboard wouldn't be taken as uh, correct, although we would take chest of drawers um, or draw, um, yeah, sorry, chest of drawers as correct. Um, 
Okay, so what's happening here is that this person seems to have a, a, a vision problem rather than a naming problem. And um, if you squint hard enough, you may be able to see the slipper. It looks like more one of those Dutch wooden shoes. Uh, if you squint, then uh, you can see that the melon may appear to look like a shoe. Um, try it, see if you, can, if you can make it work for you. But um, it's come up quite a few times and it's actually quite a regular error. Okay, so common questions we get on this task are things like, you know, why are they grayscale? Why aren't you using photographs? And this is done very much on purpose. We want it to be sensitive enough. Uh, as we all know, it's much easier to name things from a color photograph than from this kind of more abstract um, 2D grayscale drawing. And it's done to make it um, difficult enough, really. And then, uh, like the example I gave you, you know, what, what's happening if this is a perceptual difficulties and this this is why they're scoring below cutoff. So they'd still be impaired on the task, but you would make a clear note that these are visual errors and you would want to investigate further uh, what's happening with these kind of visual errors. Is it just a matter of um, detailed vision and they just need glasses or is there other things going on and you might want to investigate uh, and assess um, further? Remember, this is just a screen. Um, and it can't do everything for you, but it will definitely give you a hint of what to look at further. And that's the case uh, here. Okay, semantics then. So the semantics task looks like this, and they're just being asked to point to the fruit, point to the animal, and point to the tool. The score is simply out of three, um, and the cutoff is three. So in healthy population norms, nobody makes mistakes here. The impairment incidence in our sample was a lot lower as well, as you can see. Um, and so typical examples when they uh, fail to do this correctly is either they just have no idea, um, can't follow the basic instructions and, and don't respond, or you might get something like where they um, respond to something within the category. So again, seem to have some sort of semantic uh, issue, um, but still are able to understand sufficiently that they understand the instructions. So again, you get kind of two levels of where things might be going wrong. Um, in both cases, they would be considered impaired on this task and you would want to understand what's underlying it by doing further assessments. So we often get asked, um, can we actually use the OX for patients with receptive aphasia if they've got difficulty in understanding language in written or spoken form? And this is something I've uh, briefly spoken about um, when I talked about background and we've tried to make as much as possible things available by demonstrating, um, by showing examples and so forth. But if there is a very severe receptive aphasia and they cannot even uh, pass this task uh, or understand what you're asking them to do here, then it is likely that um, very few of the following tasks will be able to complete and maybe you want to call it a day and, and stop the assessment here. So the next question is an orientation one. And this one is a simple four questions about the city or town people are in at the moment of a assessment, what part of day it is. So here you're just looking for things like morning or afternoon or evening um, you're also telling them explicitly without looking at a clock um, can you tell me what part of the day it is just roughly approximately and then you ask them for the month and the year and so similarly as with the previous task the normative data um, is uh, at ceiling for these um, tasks and questions where people don't tend to make any mistakes and so anyone uh, showing impairment here by making a single error would be classed as impaired. Incidence of impairment in our sample was about a quarter of our patients that we assessed. So some example responses would be, again, in the case of uh, full expressive aphasia, if they are not responding, but then you move to multiple choice, um, you can find that all multiple choice questions are correct, and so they would score four out of four. And second um, example is where people might say their hometown instead of the current place they're at, um, say something wrong in part of the day, uh, get the month correct, get the year incorrect and, and kind of show this kind of disorientation uh, and so failure on orientation in time and space. Common questions we get here is about using the multiple choice questions. Do you adjust the scores? and 
if they need uh, MCQ, do they automatically score lower? And so the answer to both of those is no. So the way the scoring has been set up is for it to not be affected by uh, aphasia. So there's no automatic penalty for you not being able to use expressive language. So in that respect, uh, when you go to multiple choice, because people uh, can't say the responses, there is no penalty and the, the scores would just be um, as normal. So any correct answer would count as a point. That said, it may be that the reason that you're trying multiple choice is not because they can't give you a free response, but more because you kind of want to prompt a little bit more to see if they would um, get it correct if you were to give them multiple choice. In that case, you would just be scoring on the free responses. So say that example who gave um, the wrong part of day, you might say, oh, um, can I just show you a few options and can you just have another go and have another think about what part of day it is now, just to see if adding the multiple choice helps them uh, figure out what is the correct answer. But those things are done more as a qualitative kind of extra trying to understand a little bit more in depth what's going on, um, but they wouldn't score for those and you wouldn't need to do those as well. So say, especially if you're pressed for time, you just want to get the scores. If people can uh, speak, then you wouldn't uh, show MCQ, but you may want to at times just to figure out um, what they're, they're like um, without it affecting the scores. The scores would be just on free response. Okay, the visual field test, um, as we've shown, is just a simple confrontation task um, where you hold your hands up in the two upper uh, quadrants and in the two lower quadrants and you're asking the participant to just look at your nose. So it's very simple if they can detect the movement in the upper left and upper right uh, and lower left and lower right, then they get the point. So here we often get asked, you know, what if they're missing one side due to severe neglect rather than due to a visual field impairment? So they are missing everything that's happening on their left side, not because they have a hemianopia, but just because the neglect is so severe uh, that they're completely oriented to the other side um, and not noticing um, anything happening in that side. So the main question then is how do you dissociate neglect from hemianopia? And so what you have to do here is actually run the neglect assessment. So you can tell if this is the case by when you then end up running the neglect task, so the, the heart cancellation task, you can then see whether they are scanning across. So if people are not scanning across and they're missing um, in this kind of visual field test, then you can't dissociate. You might say it could be that they have both, but they definitely also have neglect. The only time you can say, well, they clearly only have a hemianopia or a quadrantinopia is when they've passed the visual field test. Um, sorry, when they don't pass the visual field test, but they do pass uh, and go and search everywhere in the um, broken hearts test. Next, this is a task on sentence reading. Uh, there's quite a complex sentence here that has got 15 words uh, split over four lines. So we've tried to keep it centered. And the scoring is very simple. You kind of go along as people are reading it and you tick off each of the words. Importantly, we'd also very much recommend that you write down the kind of errors people make um, rather than just do a tick and a cross. You don't really need it for the score. In the end, you can just score whatever is correct and incorrect, but you do need it um, for yourself to maybe interpret or to maybe guide what kind of full assessment uh, may be needed. The cutoff here on the UK norms is 14. That means people can make one error and still be okay. Once people start making more than one error, then they would be considered uh, impaired on this task. So here's some example response. Um, classic example would be something like any of the lands got a quay, fought the colonel on his yacht. So you get a series of types of errors here, which may hint at different things. So, for example, lands instead of islands, um, missing the have seems to point towards having an issue on the left hand side, also completely missing the word sitting. Um, they've clearly uh, got a very severe left sided neglect, which is causing them to either miss complete words 
or miss parts of words, which is something we call neglect dyslexia, when they're missing specific um, parts of a word that are lateralized. So it could be either a missing or it could be a substitution. So they might say something like hands um, rather than uh, land. So they, these kind of lateralized errors um, point towards possibility of neglect dyslexia. You've only got the one word here, so you're not entirely sure, but here's another one then. Uh, thought instead of thought. So this is starting to very much paint a picture where you might want to do a more fuller reading assessment to see uh, what's going on. On the other side here, we have these kind of um, regularizations, as we would call it. So quay instead of key, and this kind of spelling out of colonel instead of colonel, and then this yacht. Um, so th there's another, um, oh, sorry. There's another hint here that there's something wrong with that kind of route to reading. So in psychology, uh, we, we have this classic dual root model to reading. One is the uh, phonetics way, which is how often a lot of the children now are being taught how to read, you know, how to pronounce each of the words off, okay, off, put it together. Um, and that route works for a lot of the simple regular words, but then with these kind of irregular words, you have to recognize them as a whole. Um, and you have to use this other route to reading, which is this kind of word recognition. Um, type role where um, when one of those roots gets impaired like, um, it's possible that you get this kind of pattern. So these are just hints. We're not saying the sentence reading is going to allow you to diagnose all of these things for sure but it will hint at these uh, potential issues that you may want to assess further. So um, common question here is often you know why do you have these complex irregular words in here so i've tried to explain already it's looking for these uh, things like surface dyslexia it's uh, known as where people um regularize this kind of reading so they might say islands for example so on the number section what you get is these kind of numbers to write um, and people are asked to write each number separately uh, the cutoff for this is three, so uh, people have to be perfect because all of our uh, healthy normative data show that um, this is a task again at ceiling um, in neurologically healthy population. Similarly, the second task is a calculation task uh, where there's some simple calculations, just some sums and subtractions. We explicitly chose not to include any multiplications or division because they tend to weigh much heavier on uh, language domains than these kind of simple calculations. We do have one uh, of each that has got a bridging function where you have to use a little bit more working memory to keep um, to keep the carry and move it to the next um, set of units. So you know, from seven plus nine, you go from these units to these teams, and you have to remember. And uh, that you have to carry one over. So the cutoff for that one is three. So that's because quite a lot of our healthy norms uh, also struggles, and particularly with this last uh, more complicated subtraction, 36 minus 17 equaling 19. Okay, so here are then some example responses of typical errors. So we very often see this um, extra zeros, we call it. So uh, people write 700 and eight or 15,000 with three zeros and then 200. And so this this is this kind of semantic um, error where for them, it, you know, 700 is 700 and it's an error in this kind of place coding of where the units and the tens and the hundreds uh, belong. Um, it's very common in acute stroke to see these kind of errors. It's much, much less common to see these errors um, six months down the line. So when we try to understand what it means, we, we probably think it has something to do with uh, executive control and, and ability to inhibit this kind of prepotent 700 uh, response um, and kind of override it with knowing, oh, actually it is 708 um, and only needs one zero to make it a hundreds. Another um, error might be some sort of perseveration on the numbers um, where single numbers get repeated um, and they uh, struggle to 
keep in mind the full number so you often see these kind of rep repeated numbers and sometimes people um, completely write very 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 long strings of either numbers or letters uh, in response to this kind of task where you're asked to um, write down some numbers on the calculation these are some typical responses um, like here where they uh, struggle to do the carry operation as well as struggled um, to see the minus and kind of continued on uh, adding up um, for example on this third one and again an, an error in the carry um, in this last one in patients with severe aphasia you will see often that um, when they can't respond and they can't say and they can't also write very well you can move straight to multiple choice and if they get all of the multiple choice correct, that would give them a score out of four out of four. So again, there would be no penalty for having to use MCQ because of an aphasia. So common questions here is about these type of errors. Do we score them differently? And so the answer again is no. An error is an error. So in terms of normal cutoffs, that's the same. But in terms of, again, trying to understand a little bit more what's going on and maybe direct uh, some of the further assessments it's very important that you write down the errors it, it really um, helps uh, to interpret so which is why we always suggest it's a good thing to not just see the scores but also see the performance of the patients it gives you a much richer picture so mcqs are not scored differently unless you're just trying to use an mcq to further probe whether they might be able to do it with an MCQ, in which case you would ignore those kind of scores. You would only uh, count the MCQ scores if they are not able to do free response. Uh, but in the end, they're not scored differently if they're being used because of a language problem. And finally, um, we often get asked if they can write things down to work out the answer, and the answer is uh, no. So the idea is that if they want to write down the response because they can't say it, that's okay but they shouldn't be using pen and paper to try and um, calculate or to try and uh, write down the operations um, to try and work it out and show the workings. Okay, next task is the heart cancellation task. So this is our neglect uh, task. And the first thing to uh, explain is that you run the practice and you explain. And so on this already, we have some common questions around what do you do if the participant can't hold a pen and although that's that isn't really underscoring i've put it here because sometimes people say oh we couldn't assess it because they couldn't hold a pen um so we couldn't actually test it and so we couldn't score it but importantly um if they can't hold a pen we would still assess it so try and get them to show you just by their finger and you as the examiner can cross out because this task is really about trying to see if they search across the space if they can orient and uh, look for things around the space and it's not about holding a pen or not holding a pen so if they can show you in another way just by pointing um, that they are exploring all of the space that's a valid response so please do assess patients who can't hold a pen as well um, finally on the scoring then of this doing this practice so if somebody has um, an object-centered problem so I, i've tried to explain this before so uh, when they consistently cross out lateralized hearts so for them they look like complete hearts and so they might do the task correctly so show that they understand um, but systematically cross out hearts with a gap on one side if you have to do the practice once or twice um, it doesn't impact the score so the score in the end is just on the actual cancellation and is nothing on how many practices you do but again these are observations that may be relevant so we do encourage you to make notes and to uh, um, keep track of these things just as a more wider um, observational picture so here's an example of egocentric neglect so where the patient has crossed out um, only a series of hearts on one particular side of the um, page and then this is a, an example of pure allocentric neglect where they've crossed out throughout all of the page, but systematically made these um, lateralized errors. So for the scoring, this is what it looks like. You can actually divide up that whole um, roster that you've just seen. Let me go back. So there's little dots here, as you can see. 
And what they denote is that if you want to score it um, by box, you can draw a line here and draw a line across and you'll see that you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten boxes. And that's what these are here. This is box one to ten. And so in each of them, there's five complete hearts. There's five hearts with a gap on the left and there's five hearts with a gap on the right. So you would go through and count how many in each of those areas, how many of the complete hearts did they get, how many of the left gaps, how many of the right gaps. So perfect performance obviously is to only have five out of five on all of the complete hearts and have zero uh, lateralized errors. But in the end, you count them up over here. So you say total number of left gap hearts, say zero, total number of right gap hearts, say five, and you will find that you then have an object asymmetry of left minus right, so you'd have an object symmetry of minus five. Similarly, you record the time, and then you also uh, count up those total corrects, so those are all of those, um, and do the space asymmetry. So for space asymmetry, you get the total correct ones, seven, eight, nine, ten. So say in this case, they've got them all, say 20, minus the total correct in these boxes and so say they didn't go to the extreme end but they got these so I'll say 10 so in that case you would have 10 a uh, 20 minus 10 so we'd have an asymmetry of 10 so the problem would be left lateralized because it's a positive value right whereas if you had a negative value you would have uh, things missing on this side so that's the thing to always remember, and I'll show you again at the end, this kind of left versus right. So all the positive asymmetry values denote left neglect. All the negative asymmetry values, be they object or space, denote right neglect. So here's the norms and the cutoffs. So there's a cutoff for the overall performance. So people who um, miss more than eight of the hearts, so of the correct ones, would be considered impaired. Um, so it's okay to miss a few, right? That's, that would be within normal um, range of the healthy neurological, neurologically healthy um, data. On the space asymmetry, uh, we would more conservatively probably say you have to have an asymmetry more than more than three, be that positive or negative. An object asymmetry, none of our healthy participants uh, showed any um, errors in cancelling out hearts with a gap. So anything that's uh, more than zero would be considered outside of the norm cutoff data. In terms of clinical relevance, that may be a different question, right? If they just make the one error, I'd be very hesitant to call that a very clear object neglect. Once they start making two, three, four, five, six, and, and, and up, that's when it becomes uh, much more um, clear that this is, this is not just a one-off error. So we typically, although the norms are zero, we would typically have a cutoff of more than one. Um, so you don't count this one-off error as a clear uh, impairment. So this is impairment incidence. About half the people uh, we tested acutely uh, show an impairment on, on level of accuracy, so got less than 42 correct. And then these kind of spatial asymmetries, um, you can see more uh, often left-sided uh, neglect than right-sided neglect, and similarly more often left-sided object neglect than right-sided object neglect. Common questions here are, you know, there's a time limit here of three minutes. Um, why is that and what happens if they fail to, to finish in that time? So the reason why there is a time limit is to keep the um, interval as stable as possible between encoding of the sentence and then the recall of the task where you have to recall the sentence. So we don't want to make that gap too wide uh, for it to become too difficult. Um, and in terms of um, what if they fail to finish, um, should we still score this? Yes, definitely, because all of the healthy participants were able to finish in that time and um, needing more than three minutes is clinically important and it may well be that they indeed don't have a neglect, uh, but have this kind of slowed processing and that's a relevant 
uh, thing to notice. So although this, this task is aimed to detect ne neglect, there's also in the overall accuracy impairment, hints at um, sustained attention, uh, hints at sel broader selective attention issues and slower processing. Again, this would be a hint, it's a screen, so we'd uh, urge you to assess further, but it will definitely give you a very clear hint at what may be the key problem here. Okay, in terms of praxis, um, the task is to copy um, what you see in a just like in a mirror. And so you get uh, a first presentation and a second presentation if you need it. So basically you do the first presentation like this and like this and they copy. And this is first gesture and second gesture. So if they get it correct, you go tick for the first one and tick for the second one and that's it. You don't repeat and they score three out of three. If, however, they make an error, so say they do this and then this, um, you would repeat the task and so you would have a tick and a cross here for the first presentation and then if second time around they get it all correct, you'd have tick and tick and they would score two out of three. If um, they still make a mistake in the second presentation, but they get one right, they would score one out of three. And if after the second presentation, they still didn't get any right, they would score zero out of three. And so that's the same for the one underneath as well. So three out of three, perfect first time. Two out of three, perfect second time. One out of three, still an error in the second presentation. Zero out of three is um, completely incorrect even after the second presentation. On the finger presence positions, you basically show them a finger position and ask them to copy it. And so you only have one box, so it's either correct or incorrect, first time, second time. Um, and that's the same for the, for the second one. So typical example responses of errors might be for the second one that they do something like this, or that they orient it the wrong way around. Um, and that kind of gets you to the common questions of how do you then score one out of three on these finger positions? Because there's no two gestures. So basically three out of three for first time perfect, two out of three for second time perfect, and uh, one out of three for second time not perfect but recognizable. So either like some sort of orientation error or something that shows you they kind of have it but not quite. Um, and so that's how you still score one out of three on the second uh, presentation. So you can get some credit for having a recognizable gesture, even though it's not perfect. Um, another common question here is, you know, what if there is severe arthritis that's preventing this full straightening of a finger? So rather than this, you get something that's more like this, but it's simply because they cannot straighten uh, their hand. In that case, you would give the score. So remember, you're only trying to assess what you're trying to assess. So if this is this is about motor planning and about mirroring. So if that is intact, then the full score is given. Um, this is not an easy task and several of our um, healthy normative control participants also make errors or need second presentation. So uh, the cutoff is, is very conservative here at eight. Okay, moving on to memory. We're on task nine. There's only 10 tasks in the OX, um, so, so we're getting through it. So memory, um, this is about first asking free recall. Do you remember the sentence you read before? Um, and um, they either remember what they, what they do, and for each one they don't remember or got incorrect, um, you move on to do recognition. So say they say, oh, it was something by islands and a kernel, but I can't quite remember what. So then you only show page two of the multiple choice and say, okay, which one of these four words was in there? Um, and similarly, you show the last one, which one of these four words was in there. So if the patient achieves full marks for recall, do you then automatically award the points for recognition? And the same for a partial score. So yes, indeed. So if their recall was fully there, then you don't test the recognition and the points just carry over. Um, so if you get four out of four here, you automatically get four out of four here. Say in our example, the person got two out of four here and then got 
both of the extra ones correct and multiple choice so they get four out of four um, there we often get asked why there's no specific cutoff for verbal recall only and that's very much to do with our idea of not um, penalizing people with an aphasia and treating everyone the same across the board um, so the cutoff is only based on um, recognition total scores um, the cutoff is also three, so people are okay to make one mistake and would still be considered uh, unimpaired. Okay, final bit of memory is then a recognition, which is just uh, task recognition, incidental uh, recognition about the things they've seen before, um, and you just count the number of correct answers. And then finally, and maybe the most difficult one, so um, if you need a little break, <laughs> put it on pause and then we can go through this one. So this is the task switching um, task. This one is probably harder to score and harder to interpret. So we'll, we'll walk you through um, what the task is. So as you know, there's three parts to it. There's two baselines where you first just connect the circles, then you just connect the triangles. And then finally, you alternate between them. Um, so the cutoff score is made on the executive score. So this executive score is the sum of the baselines. So sum of circles and triangles minus the score on the mixed. And we'll talk you through some examples so you can see how that works and why that was uh, set up to be like that. So on the first example responses, I'm just going to show you some examples of patients I've had before. So this would be um, simple failure to understand the instruction, um, kind of repetitive behavior, um, this kind of perseveration uh, and just drawing lines without really understanding uh, what the task is. Next, um, this happens quite often as well, where people, again, don't quite understand the task and are just trying to connect uh, two shapes at a time rather than uh, make a full trail. So this is why we run the practice. So we try and explain it, but sometimes even after explaining and trying to do joint practice, um, people still don't really um, get how to do the final task. Uh, and finally, this would be an example of someone who starts off OK and then stops switching and continues on one shape. This is a very common error and this is a very classic problem in the switching aspect. And that's uh, what this task is really about with that executive score because what we're trying to understand is not just simple instruction comprehension and trail making but this kind of added cost of having to switch and this kind of added executive load um, what that does and whether that particularly is impaired so here's another example that uh, maybe some of you have come across which looks like this on the switching task. Um, and so they would have scored, say, 6 out of 13. Um, and what's happening here is, even though we've tried to really keep it central, some patients with very severe neglect, and uh, especially if they have both object and space, and then this, this kind of incidental neglect where they're not specifically being told, oh, we'll try and get all of the space, but just, you know, make this trail. Um, often you see this exacerbated... Um, neglect response where they just fail to explore one side of the shapes um, but this is again why we have the baselines because they're doing quite a good job in switching as you can see you know uh, they're clearly switching in the space that they can see and then when you compare the baseline performance um, to this kind of executive score you will find that these people would not be classed as impaired because they don't seem to have this added executive switching uh, deficit. In fact, they do just as well or better than on the single baseline tasks. And that's what this task is getting at. Um, geez, I'm sure this point, okay, yeah, common question is, you know, but what if they fail, like your first participants who, you know, don't really get the task, they still won't have an executive score below cutoff, but surely these people are impaired. and. This is, this is a crucial part to think about. So when we call an executive impairment, we want to specifically look at this higher order switching impairment that's above and beyond 
simple trail making. It's about this level of high level switch that goes on. So, um, so indeed they would not be impaired on the switching, but they would be impaired overall. And uh, we would make clear notes that what's happening here is uh, impairment on each of the tasks. Um, and basically much more likely to be an impairment in understanding of complex instruction than an executive um, high level switching impairment. So the manual states to record a time. Why, why do you have to do this? Um, is there a maximum time allowed? So yeah, we have maximum time for each of the baselines and particularly to go on 30 seconds. Um, there's no maximum time on the switching. Um, but the timing is there because we've recorded it in a healthy population and sometimes these kind of more subtle deficits may be obvious in timing only and not in accuracy. Um, we've really tried to design these tasks to be more about accuracy than um, reaction time because there's a lot of confounds when you're using time in these kind of neurological populations. They may already have a general slowing due to motor deficits, which is nothing to do with their cognitive deficits. Um, but nevertheless, if you know that um, they're fine in, in that respect, you can look at the added time it takes to do the switching compared to the baseline. And there is norms for that in the original uh, normative paper. But it's uh, most of the time um, we focus on accuracy, but it's there. OK, next section, how to interpret those cutoffs. So here we go again. This is the same overview I've shown you before. And you can see here uh, we've added this in. So if the um, asymmetry is more than one versus less than minus one. So this denotes left neglect, this denotes right, and again, left and right. And um, so we've added that in here. Um, so you kind of have this kind of keep uh, reference to keep uh, looking at. And so all the other scores are here as well, but importantly also this kind of overall score uh, and so on. So then um, this is the detail. So in case that other one was a little bit small for you, but we've gone over all of these tasks specifically. Um, and you can see some of these are basically people need to be at ceiling and anything below ceiling is uh, impaired. And sometimes uh, one or two errors are allowed within the normal range. OK, so here's some extra questions uh, overall about is there any norm for the total score of the ox? So there is no straightforward just adding up of all scores and getting to a total score, as you may know from things like the MOCA or the ACE. Um, and that's mainly because they would be very severely weighted by some of the tasks. For example, the, the heart's cancellation task is out of 50. Whereas a lot of the other scores are only at a four. And if we totaled them all up, um, it'd be very much driven by that performance in some of the, the bigger scored items. So we don't uh, do that. So you can't get a total score in that way. Um, in order to get some idea about severity overall, um, we have suggested that people use total number of tasks impaired. So we've just walked through all of them. So there's about 10 tasks. And in that sense, you might get a bit of an idea of severity overall across domains, whether they're impaired in one task versus uh, seven tasks will give you a, a different clinical picture. Um, it's worth thinking about this, though, because it may be that you have a relatively small impairment in several tasks versus a very, very severe impairment in one task. So this kind of severity uh, depends on how you look at it. If we do this, we're kind of talking about overall burden uh, of um, domain impairments and um, higher numbers mean more specific uh, domains and tasks impaired. And the norms for that is, is simply the, the same. Anything more than zero would be outside of the norms, right? Because by definition, each of the tasks have their own cutoffs. So um, having a total score of total impairment score, anything higher than zero would be um, an impairment. So we also often get asked about this um, norm data. You know, most of the norm data from our original paper was gathered in people aged over 65. And so does this mean that we can't use the screen in younger stroke survivors? And, and the answer obviously is no, please do use it in, in um, younger stroke survivors. But maybe be aware that those cutoffs um, may be um, quite liberal in, in that sense for maybe younger people. 
But if they are impaired on the older cutoffs, then they, they would definitely be impaired. So it's only going in one direction, if that makes sense. So say a person scores two out of four on the naming, um, that would be impaired for the over 65s, that will definitely be impaired for the under 65s as well. So the cutoffs definitely do apply. Maybe they're a little bit generous for younger people, uh, but at the same time, this is just a screen and you're just looking at this very kind of gross domain specific impairment. Um, and for that, definitely um, you can use it. Um, more norms are being gathered and several of the translations are gathering uh, wider age range norms. Um, but we chose specifically to go for the older population because that is the, the population that we, we end up seeing. Next up, how to use the wheel of cognition. So this is what it looks like. This is how we report. So for example, you would cross out um, two areas where they were impaired and you'd make a little comment. Um, similarly, you would do so as you go uh, around and do all the other tasks. It's nice to also note when people do very well. So, you know, this clearly in this case, for example, um, there's a language impairment. Um, but they still could do calculation. So it's it's nice to highlight the elements of preserved function as well. Um, this patient also shows some sequencing and, and um, praxis issues. Um, poor verbal memory specific on the language components likely related to the fact that they have poor language encoding and they had issues with the reading uh, and the naming. And in this case, and also an uh, object neglect. So here the exact score, as you can see, is not crossed out, so they weren't particularly impaired, but they had poor complex instruction understanding, uh, both in baseline and switching was poor, and, and these were the scores. So these kind of bits around the frame are to write comments, to write specific scores, to write observations. So we encourage people very much to use that space and to add more than just coloring in um, the wheel and actually use it to, to report some of these extra elements. Nevertheless, you can see at a glance here where people's strengths and weaknesses are and just looking across the different domains. Here's a second example. This person made the specific neglect dyslexia um, question mark. Um, errors that didn't seem to have a visual field deficit, but they still did this. Um, showed these extra zeros happening in the writing. Uh, and they stopped switching four shapes in. Um, they checked the task understanding at the end and that was all, all good. Um, so it wasn't that they didn't understand. So perhaps, you know, you might think is this kind of hinting at something like goal neglect where they do understand the rules and they know what they have to do but then they fail um, to follow those instructions when it actually comes down to it and um, so again this is something you might want to look at in a bit more depth um, and that's it that's the last example and that's the end of this session so thanks very much for listening to this one as well um, we've got the website uh, oxtest.org where you find everything and then my lab website about ongoing research. If you're interested, uh, come and take a look. Thanks very much.